Palm Sunday at New Hope Community Church. It's great to have you with us today, and it is a most special day. Our kids' choir is going to be coming in in a few minutes and singing for us today about what this week is all about. So thank you for being at New Hope on, uh, on this Sunday of the year. If you're a guest today, uh, it's also rodeo month, so that's the reason. I mean, of course, I don't need a reason to wear, you know, Wranglers or Levi's or Lee's and Western shirts, but uh, the reason for the black hat is because this is an ugly week. <laughs> this week is an ugly week. It's not until you get to Sunday that everything changes. And so there's a lesson there for all of us. You may think you've got an ugly week going on. But as uh, Tony Campolo used to say, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. You don't experience a resurrection until after a crucifixion. And so this week may be ugly, but next week answers all the questions. And we're going to be looking at that today through music and through message today. So we are so glad you're here. Uh, may I direct your attention to the screen for our morning announcements. April 19th is Good Friday. And we have a special service here at New Hope at 6 p.m. And this year we'll be answering the question, what if? As it relates to God's love, God's sacrifice, and God's forgiveness. So come and join us on Good Friday as we remember the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'd love to see you there. The Apostle Paul said that if it was not for the resurrection, then everything else in the life of Jesus would have been inconsequential. Next Sunday, we are celebrating the most incredible moment in the history of the world. It's when Jesus was raised from the dead. His crucifixion, was the payment for our sinfulness. His resurrection is the indwelling presence he offers to us in the life of a Christian. We will be celebrating that next Sunday morning. We have three special Easter services. Notice the time of the first service, 7.45, then 9.15, and then 11 o'clock. If you are one of our regular attenders at 9.15 or 11 o'clock, look around. If we're getting very full, we have an overflow room available just across the pavilion. Be willing to give up your seat so that a first time visitor or guest can have a seat in the sanctuary. So I hope to see you next Sunday at either 745, 915, or 11 o'clock. It's a wonderful Sunday to bring a family member, a neighbor, or a guest. We would love to see you Easter Sunday morning. Good morning, ladies. You wanted a book club, we didn't give you one. We gave you four, and the next group are starting the week of April 25th. If you're interested, go online to our church website, look up which group suits your needs the best, and contact that group leader. Enjoy and have happy reading. Who knew our seniors could move so fast? Our seniors' lunch egg hunt was a success. In less than five minutes, 450 eggs were gathered. And here's where the winning tables chose to donate $50 each. The Fresno Rescue Mission, Aviation in Action, the Ronald McDonald House, and the Marjorie Mason Center. Thanks, seniors. We'll see you next month. And our senior election this week went wonderfully well. It was great. It was terrific. And uh, there were no injuries in the egg hunt. All right. So uh, everybody went home just fine. And just a quick prelude for next month's senior luncheon. It is Senior Carnival Day. So remember last year in June, we did a carnival for you. It was a big, over 200 showed up. Uh, we're doing it a month earlier this year, so it's cooler, not quite so hot. And uh, there's going to be all kinds of games and activities and just lots of junk food for you to eat. All right? So uh, you'll be hearing more about that after Easter Sunday. If you are a guest with us today, you've honored us by your presence. There is a communication card in the pew in front of you. Or if you happen to be on the front, it's on the pew right behind you. Somebody will hand you one. Would love for you to fill it out, drop it in the offering when it comes by in a few moments, and then next week through the mail, not at your door, not on the phone, but only through the mail, we'll send you information that we hope answers a lot of questions about New Hope Church. Those same cards are also there for 
our regular attenders. If you have messages to the staff, you need an appointment, uh, there's a prayer request that you'd like to update us on, please use those cards for that. We attend to those every Tuesday morning as a staff. Also, if you have received Christ in your life, whether it's recently or it's been a little while, and you have never been baptized, and you would like to take that step of obedience and be baptized, take a card, put your name and contact information on it, check baptism. We will send you the information about baptism, and we are going to be setting a date uh, in the next couple of weeks. Let me say that differently. Over the next couple of weeks, we are going to set a date in which we will have uh, our next baptism. And so uh, we just want to see how many we need to prepare for. So those are a few of the updates. Next Sunday, please note if you want to come to the early service, which usually has the best seating, it starts at 745. All right? And then the other two services are regular schedule, 9.15 and 11 o'clock. You heard me share a little bit that if we will be full and running over, okay? Uh, so if you're a regular and you notice that we've got all the chairs out and there's no room and you see guests walking in late, all right, or right before we start, get up, go out those doors and walk over to our bridge, all right, the high school room. It's our overflow. That is going through a transformation this week. Starting tomorrow morning, there's going to be a group of guys over there working. And before next Sunday, it's going to have new lights, new paint job, new back wall. All right, that's going to look really cool. And two 75-inch screens hanging down from the stage. So you'll be able to see and hear everything very, very well. All right? So you need to pray for all those guys who are doing the work next week that there's not any major setbacks. Because next Sunday's Easter. <laughs> okay, it's Easter, all right? So uh, anyway, they're going to be doing that, and we're so grateful for that. The only thing going on here this week in terms of Bible studies, uh, everything has been uh, canceled for this week. Our kids, by the way, 53 New Hopians are now in Mexico, all right? They left at 7.30 yesterday. They arrived at the border at 3.30. Fastest trip ever, all right? And uh, no problems getting across the border, and everything is going very, very well down there uh, on their first day. So we are grateful for that. Uh, but they're all gone. Our, our Most of our women's and men's groups are taking a break for the week. So the only Bible study happening here this week is uh, the men's Thursday morning Bible study that I lead meets in the office. Uh, they, they prove to be the most spiritual members of our congregation. <laughs> They chose not to take this week off, all right? They, no, no, we, we must meet and pray, all right? And so, anyway, uh, they are meeting, but that's over in the office building. We do have a memorial service here tomorrow. It started out as just a service only, no reception. But as they got into their plans, which often happens, they then asked, could we do a, a memorial, sir, or do a reception afterwards? As most of you know, as I don't like telling anybody no at moments like this. And so even though our room is going to be under remodel work, I explained to them we would be happy to do it for them if they're okay with the pavilion and the grass area and our fifth and sixth grade room. And they said they would be most happy with that. So um, thank you for those of you who made yourselves available to help set up, to serve, and to clean up on such short, short notice. Thank you for that. We did put a, a request out they're having the meal catered except for dessert, and uh, I volunteered us for that. You all love me so much. Thank you for your, your quick response. Here's the deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to frustrate Angel and Shelly right now. I don't think 10 is going to be enough. We requested 10 desserts, so I think uh, he's, he's a year younger than I am. He went to high school. His daughter and son-in-law moved in across the street from where Shelly and I now live. And so as I've been talking with them over the last couple of days, this is going to be bigger than they thought. So I need about 10 more desserts. I got four more in the 8 o'clock service. Do I have five in this service that would drop off a dessert by 10 in the morning? Thank you very much. No more. No more anybody else raise your hand. I don't have your name. I don't have your contact information. We'll have no way of knowing whether you brought it or not. I'm just trusting you. That's why Shelly and Angel are 
going to be annoyed by that because they like to know. All right, <laughs> they, they cover my backside, but uh, I just really think so. If you could drop those off by 10 o'clock here at the church tomorrow, that would be great. Thank you for helping out in that area. Let me highlight a few other prayer requests real quick and we'll get on to our music. Uh, David James, David Waves, everybody knows who you are over there. David James leaves tomorrow for Cedar sinai He is going to have one, two, or three back surgeries this next week. Um, one may lead to another, could lead to another, all right? Uh, and we are praying that this particular procedure or series of procedures is the one that brings him some relief. It's been going on for a long time now, so be praying for David as he heads down there. Uh, Carl and Carolyn in our church. Uh, Carolyn's uh, brother-in-law passed away yesterday. He's been battling uh, stage 4 cancer. He had a heart attack on Friday. He went home to be with Jesus yesterday. He is doing better than any one of us in this room is doing right now. And uh, we rejoice that he knew Jesus. Uh, Mike Rasmussen is a gentleman I met for the first time yesterday at Saint, uh, excuse me, at Clovis Community Hospital. He, uh, some friends of his are in our church and he's been to a couple of memorial services that we've shared in with that family. And uh, he's 46 years old. He's had a return of cancer. Um, he asked if I would come visit with him. So I went and saw him yesterday morning. Uh, had a great visit with him. Uh, he said, Tim, I accepted Jesus as a, young, as a young person in church, but as an adult, I've pretty much done my own thing. I knew better. I know better. I want to be better. And uh, I had a wonderful time with him. We then prayed. He got his heart right with Jesus. And a few minutes later, uh, a friend who was also a Christian walked in. I was able to tell him about, uh, about Mike's new relationship with Jesus, and he continued to stay for a while and encourage him. So we're so happy about that. While I was walking into Clovis Community Hospital, I got a text uh, from Tom Riska from our church, who was in the 8 o'clock service this morning. Tom said, any chance anybody could get by and visit my mother? She's in ICU at Clovis Community Hospital. I was walking in the front door of class. I said, you know, I think that could happen today. And uh, so I had a chance. Her name is Angie Riska. She happens to be a preacher's kid who's now about 90 years old. Uh, she loves Jesus, and she's much nicer than her son Tom. And uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful visit with her. Uh, it's my kind of visit. She had a mask on her face, and I did all the talking. So it was a wonderful... <laughs> Actually, she was able to respond, and we had a grand time. They, they just don't know what's wrong, so they're trying to figure it out. And uh, the service that's here tomorrow, if I fail to mention his name, his name is Danny Heinz. And so please remember uh, the Heinz and, uh, and the Solace family, all right? So I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. Oh, i got to pass around a sign-up sheet. The only thing on the sign-up sheet is uh, Angel Tree Football Camp coming up May the 4th. If you would like to be a volunteer to impact uh, elementary age children's lives, at a sports camp. These are kids who have one or both parents incarcerated in prison and through the Angel Tree Christmas program, uh, this is another way to reach out to those kids. And there'll probably be two to three hundred kids there. And uh, it is also always a wonderful experience. If you'd like to be a part of that, you don't have to know a thing about football and you don't even have to be athletic. In fact, you can be kind of clumsy and they'll still put you to use. Uh, so just put your name and contact information on there and somebody will follow up with you about what your response Abilities will be that day. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. While the offering's being taken, those doors are going to open, our kids are going to come in, and you are in for a treat this morning, all right, as our elementary age kids share with us the message of Easter. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the life that you share with us. Thank you for the season that prompts us to remember who Jesus is and what he did for us. Father, thank you for our children and the impact that uh, you have made on their lives as a result of, uh, of Sunday school and the Easter story and how they're going to share it with us today. We commit to you the needs that we've talked about from David James surgery to those going through cancer treatment to those, um, Father, who are serving in Mexico right now during Easter week. We just surrender all those needs to you. Thank you in advance for what you want to do in and through us today. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we say thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've uh, been around New Hope very long, uh, you've been here on previous Palm Sundays, it is no secret that uh, I don't like Palm Sunday. I never have. It's always a conflicted Sunday for me. Uh, it started out with a celebration, and yet all the folks who were all on the streets shouting and praising Jesus were a bunch of hypocrites. So it always starts out on a bad note for me. 
Uh, I always try to find different ways to uh, make me like Palm Sunday. Uh, so today, uh, what we're going to attempt to do is look at Palm Sunday of what it can teach us. And I discovered this week that one of the things I think Palm Sunday can really teach us is how to deal with stress. Any of you ever get stressed out? <laughs> Let's see if we can learn something from, uh, from Easter week. Uh, in 2001, I know that's 18 years ago, but in 2001 the Mayo Clinic claimed that 80 to 85 percent of total caseload was due directly to worry and anxiety. A more recent survey done in 2015, not by Mayo Clinic, but another research organization, uh, said those numbers really have not changed. Many experts say that coping with stress is the number one health priority of the 21st century. One leading physician was stated that in his opinion, 70% of all medical patients could cure themselves if they would just get rid of worry and fear. We know that medical science has closely tied worry to heart trouble, blood pressure, problems, ulcers, thyroid malfunction, migraine headaches, a host of stomach disorders, amongst others. For example, 25 million Americans have high blood pressure due to stress and anxiety. One million more develop uh, high blood pressure every year. Eight million Americans have stomach ulcers. Every week, 112 million people take medication for stress-related symptoms. It's interesting. Stress gets produced not only by negative experiences, but also by positive ones. It was for this reason that Donna Parker hesitated to tell her husband about winning the Reader's Digest Association sweepstakes. She was ecstatic when she got the call informing her that a certified check for $4 million would be arriving in just a few days. All their dreams would finally come true. Mike, her husband, was recovering from a massive heart attack and the doctor said excitement about anything could be dangerous. Winning the money was such great news, but Donna didn't think her husband's heart would take all the stress. So she decided to call the pastor and ask his advice because he had exper experience in breaking stressful news to families. So she told the pastor about winning the sweepstakes. How she was afraid if she told Mike, he might get so excited that he would have another heart attack. The preacher said he thought he could help. In about an hour, the pastor arrived at their home, went into the den where Mike was watching TV. They had a nice little chat back and forth for a few moments, and then the pastor leaned over and said, Mike, I got a problem, and I need some advice from you. Mike said, sure, anything I can do. The, the pastor took a deep breath and went on. He said, now this is a, a theoretical situation regarding Christian stewardship. <laughs> he said, what would a person, uh, take you for instance, do if all of a sudden you found out that you had won four million dollars, what would you do with all that money? That's easy, Mike replied. I would start by giving two million dollars to the church. <laughs> Whereupon the pastor had a heart attack and was rushed to the hospital. <laughs> See, stress, stress can come from positive as well as negative things. And guys, wave at me if, I, if you feel like I'm yelling at you. I woke up, both of my ears are plugged today. So I feel like I'm in a cave, all right? So if, if, if you think I'm yelling at you, wave. Uh, I'll get louder. Uh, <laughs> according to WebMed, any of you ever Google WebMed for things? All right, according to WebMed, stress is any change in the environment that requires our body to react and adjust in response. The body reacts to changes that are physical, that are mental, that are emotional. Stress is a normal part of life. Many events that happen to you and around us, and many things that we do to ourselves put stress in our body. We can experience good or bad forms of stress from our environment, from our body, and even from our thoughts. The human body is designed to experience stress and to respond to it. Stress can be positive. I learned a new word this week. It's called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. -E -S -S. Any of you ever heard that word before? Eustress? New one to me, all right? It'll make more sense in just a moment. Such as, are you cold or hot? 
Okay, let's up the coolers. <laughs> up the coolers, somebody. Thank you, Milo. All right. Uh, uh, push the buttons up. There we go. I figured if I was really comfortable, some of you would be cool, except for two of you ladies that are fanning. And we know... <laughs> Nothing I can do about that stress, all right? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> One of them put their fan down real quick, all right? Raylene just doesn't care, all right? <laughs> oh, now I'm stressed. Uh. All right, so stress can be positive. You stress, such as getting a job promotion or a raise or being given more responsibility. It's keeping us alert and ready to avoid danger. Stress becomes negative and we call it distress. You stress, positive. Distress, negative. When a person faces continuous challenges without relief or relaxation between challenges. As a result, the person becomes overworked and stress-related and tension builds. It's kind of like um, asking somebody, uh, I should have had a, 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 a shall I hand me that cup of water down there, would you please? This perfect. Thank you, dear. All right. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she beautiful? I'm so blessed. I caught her at a weak moment. Uh, but, but if I ask any of you, could you hold this cup of water, I think all of you would say yes. And uh, what does this cup of water weigh? Probably uh, five, six ounces probably something like that maybe, you, you could hold. But what if I ask you to hold it for an hour? What if I ask you to hold it for six hours? What if I ask you to hold it for 24 hours? The size of the cup doesn't change. But the stress level would go up because of how long you had to deal with something. That's kind of an indication of a how stress can build up in our lives and situations and circumstances. Distress leads to physical symptoms like headaches, upset stomach, blood pressure, migraines, chest pain. Research suggests that stress also can bring on or worsen symptoms or diseases. Stress also becomes harmful when people try to solve it with other things like alcohol or tobacco or drugs. Unfortunately, instead of relieving stress and returning the body to its relaxed state, these substances tend to keep the body in an extended state of stress and causes even more issues. Consider a few of the following statistics. 43% of all adults suffer adverse health effects from stress. There's about, um, there's probably about uh, 170 people in this sanctuary right now. So that means 80 of you are experiencing at this very moment ill effects of stress. 75% um, to 90% of all doctor office visits are for stress-related ailments and complaints. Can you imagine how many doctors would be out of business if we stopped being stress-filled? Stress can play a part in headaches, high blood pressure, anxiety, diabetes, skin conditions, asthma, arthritis, depression, and anxiety. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, declared that stress is a hazard in the workplace. It costs the American industry more than $300 billion annually. The lifetime prevalence of an emotional disorder is more than 50%, and it's often due to chronic untreated stress reactions. Listen to a true story shared by Joe Buzello. He said, I have told this story. Let me back up here and get it right. I have told this story. I have rarely told this story in a non-fictional format. I've certainly told this tale through the life of a fictional character that I wrote about, Tony DiBona, in my 2015 novel, Drawing Circles. In that novel, I painted a fairly dark picture of what happened to Tony in 1978. But the truth is, what I wrote in that book really happened to me in real life. In fact, my real life story is much worse than the fictional story. If you were alive and old enough to recall the 80s, yeah, most of you qualify in here. <laughs> if you were alive and old enough to recall the 80s, now the next one might be questionable, or sober enough to remember that decade, 
You will recollect that it was kind of a screwed up plastic time, a time when simply making as much money as you could or conspicuously consuming everything you could was the primary focus of a lot of people. It was not a very spiritual or well-balanced time. It was just a big game of, look at me, look how I'm doing, look at all my stuff. I don't know if you've ever felt like you had completely and totally arrived in life, like you were really some hot stuff. I'm not sure if you ever experienced having the beautiful big home in an expensive neighborhood, the exotic sports cars, the Jaguars, in the driveway, and a, a, a beautiful arm candy spouse. You may have never had all this while also having relative, uh, a lot of relatively free time to vacation whenever you want, wherever you would like, and not have to worry about getting back to the job because there was no job. You were the boss. I'm not certain how many people have experienced this on top of the world feeling while also loving their work, which mainly consisted of flying into a city, being picked up by a host, walking onto a stage to the thundering applause of hundreds and sometimes thousands adoring people. But that's exactly where I was in January of 1987, so says Joe. He said, I was only 26 years old. And I'm not going to lie to you, it was awesome. If you would have asked me on New Year's Eve 1986 what I thought my prospects were for the new year and beyond, I would have told you world domination was not out of the question for me. 1987 was simply going to be my best year ever for my brutal bride and myself. I won't bore you with all the details of how it was actually all lost, but to help make my point, here's a short list of the bad stuff that happened over the next 12 months. My family and I lost $470,000 in a real estate deal that turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. I lost my MLM business and all the income derived from it. I went through all of my personal savings. I had nothing left. I declared personal bankruptcy and I lost my entire credit standing. All of my cars were repossessed. We pawned all of our jewelry. We sold most of our furniture. My home went into foreclosure proceedings. Virtually all of my so-called friends turned their back on me, and my closest friend at that time was the one who perpetrated the Ponzi scheme. He actually pled guilty and wound up in club fed. I was initially being investigated by federal authorities as a possible accomplice to the Ponzi scheme, but fortunately I was quickly cleared. My father died of cancer. My wife left me. I tried to burn down my house while drunk. By New Year's Eve of 1987, I was hanging on to a few of the last bits and pieces of my shattered life. By the first quarter of 1988, I was literally sifting through the ashes of what I'd burnt down around me. Oh, what a year. That transpired in 12 months in one person's life. And it pales in comparison to what happened in the life of Jesus Christ this one week in history. And yet I think in the middle of this one horribly bad week in history, we find the lesson of how to overcome stress in our life. So let me briefly walk you through what started today and what ended on Friday. Everything I'm going to share with you happened in those six days in the life of one person. People are still freezing. Let's just turn the coolers off for right now. All right? Just take that one button and go from, from uh, cool to off. Both, make sure both of them are. All right? On both sides. Thank you. I see people snuggling a lot right now. Of course, it might be good for the marriage, all right? It might be good for the marriage, as long as it's your spouse, all right? You're... <laughs> Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 12. I'm not really going to read any specific long passage, but I'm going to walk you through what happens in this one week. It begins like this in chapter 12, verse 12 of the Gospel of John. The next day the great crowd that had come for the feast had heard Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and they took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! As you heard these kids sing just a few minutes ago. That word literally means save now. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it was written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. That was a prophecy predicted all the way back in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. That's the beginning of Easter week. It's called Palm Sunday, or as we shared with you last week, Passion Sunday, the beginning of Passion Week. So let me just outline for you now, and I'll give you some quick references if you want to write them down, of everything that happened over the next six days. It started with this parade into Jerusalem, and it was a fake celebration. Those people didn't want Jesus the Messiah. They wanted Jesus a deliverer from Roman rule and domination. They wanted their circumstances changed, not their character transformed. How many times do you and I pray a prayer very similar to their, their Sunday celebration? And what we want is God to change our circumstances rather than to transform us. The second thing that takes place, we would have to go back to Matthew. John does not record it, but the next thing that happens of major significance is Jesus, uh, after he finishes the parade, he goes to the temple. He goes to church. And when he gets there, he finds hypocrisy at its worst. He doesn't find them worshiping. He finds them profit-making. He finds them selling things at an enormous profit in the church because they're, they're, they're there for a, an annual celebration and they've raised the cost, price of, 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 of uh, um, demand and supply. supply and demand. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Supply and demand. And since the demand, uh, the, the supply, the demand was up, <laughs> they rose the prices. Jesus chases everybody out of the temple. You've changed my father's house to a den of thieves. We can go on. In John chapter 13, the Passover takes place. Matthew 26 describes both the pass. It describes the Passover. And John 13 describes feet washing. What an event that was that night. You see, it was Passover week. It was when all Jews remembered their history and they remembered the great links that God went to to deliver their forefathers and mothers out of Egyptian captivity and to take them to a place of promise. And Jesus tells his most intimate of friends, his 12 disciples, this long-standing tradition I'm not going to destroy, but I'm going to give it a new, deeper, more personal meaning. The blood of lambs and bulls and goats were spread on the doorposts of the Jewish homes in Egypt so the death angel would pass over that night the tenth plague and after that tenth plague Egypt let Israel go. Jesus said in a matter of hours I'm going to put my blood on the cross timbers of a crucifixion cross and the price of that blood is going to allow Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every girl since the fall of Adam until I come again to allow, allow them to be delivered from the pain and the consequence of their sin. And they will now have the freedom of forgiveness and eternal life. And after Jesus explains how he's going to get all of our vertical relationships right with God the Father... The scripture in John 13 says when supper was over that Jesus took a pitcher and a basin and a towel and he went and washed the feet of every one of his 12 disciples, including Judas. And then Jesus looked at his friends and he said, as I have done to you, now you do to each other. In other words, as God forgives you through what I have done for you, now you forgive each other. You see, these 12 disciples, they were flawed. They had been fighting and bickering recently. Judas was betraying. The mother of James and John snuck into Jesus and said, hey, when you get to your kingdom, put my sons on the right and the left hand. Give them places of power. There was jealousy amongst them. They were dysfunctional. Sounds like church, doesn't it? But God said, hey, don't, you, you don't work on this relationship until you work on this relationship. And now when this one is lined up, now do the same thing with each other that I have done for you. I want you to understand something. I didn't, I didn't figure this out till this week. 
And, and I had to be careful how I word it because how I'd word it initially was under pressure. This last week, Jesus preached some of his best sermons. And then it dawned on me, did he ever preach a bad one? So maybe I shouldn't say these were his best sermons, but, but these were some of his most memorable sermons. All happened in the last week of his life, not the first two and a half years, but in this very last week. Let me highlight just a few of them. Week John chapter 14 comes after John 12, so obviously it took place after his, his triumph. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is approaching the worst week of his life. He's going to face more trouble than he ever has in his 33 years of life and living on earth. And he said, hey, in the midst of trouble, don't let your hearts be troubled. We find in John chapter 15, Jesus shares the story and the message of the vine branch relationship. Abide in me and I will abide in you. In John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, Jesus tells them about the promised coming of the Holy Spirit when Jesus finishes his work and what the work of the Holy Spirit will be in our lives as Christians now. In John chapter 16, and let me just read that verse, John 16, 33. It's one we love to quote in all kinds of situations and circumstances. Jesus says, I have told you these things. So that in me, in the relationship with Jesus Christ, we may have peace. And then he's really straightforward. In this world you'll have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Don't look at the trouble and let it be the reason why you're not at peace. Look at me in the midst of your trouble and I will give you peace. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus gives to them the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God. When his love fills your heart, love each other. All of that transpired in these last six days of his life. Now, now let's move on to what else happened this week. John chapter 17, it's also recorded in Luke chapter 22. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And notice he goes with all of his disciples except Judas. Judas was off working out the details to betrayal. And then Jesus pulls three of them, Peter, James, and John aside. And they walk a little further in the garden. And then he leaves those three there and asks them to pray specifically for him. And then Jesus goes on a little farther by himself. And he and God spend time together. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. And then in John chapter 18, Jesus is betrayed with a kiss by Judas. The next verse, Jesus is arrested. In the next verse, Peter begins his denials. Three denials before the cock crows the next morning. John chapter 19, Jesus is flogged. Jesus is mocked. Jesus is crucified. In the midst of all this going on, then look what Jesus does from the cross in Luke 23, 34, that famous quote, Father, forgive them, for they have no idea what they're doing. In the midst of all of the betrayal, the arrest, the mocking, everything that's going on, the heart of Jesus is one filled with forgiveness with those who were inflicting the pain. Wow. And then in Matthew 27, 45, the next thing that happens on the cross is God the Father departs from the Spirit of God the Son. Jesus says, my God, why have you forsaken me? This gets a little theological, but hang with me for just a couple of minutes. From the conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary, God the Son had never known the absence of God the Father by the person of the Holy Spirit in his human spirit. Jesus was going to be born in the same fashion that Adam had been created, with the presence of God in him. And so for the 33 years that Jesus lived as man on earth, he always had the abiding and dwelling presence of his Father through the Holy Spirit in him. Jesus said it this way himself. Every word that I say, every miracle that I do, every action that I take, it is not me, but it is my Father in me who does it. 
And then here's the kicker, and this is the hope for you and me, that Jesus in the next breath goes on to say, and as my Father sent me, as my Father sent me with all that he is for everything that I need, now I send you into the world with everything that I, the Lord Jesus, am for everything that you, Peter, James, and John, for everything that you need. And that is the role and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life today. Is it just as God the Father through the person of the Holy Spirit provided everything that the Lord Jesus needed to do, to be, to say, and was. So now the Lord Jesus provides everything in you and in me that we need. The problem is, will we let him? Jesus did. And so Jesus hanging on the cross, his sinless perfection now being tarnished, stained, just as badly as his body had been mutilated, the scripture says, beyond recognition. Now the soul of Jesus was so tarnished, damaged, destroyed, stained, scarred by your sin and by your sin and by your sin and by your sin and by my sin that God the Father says, I can't dwell where their sin is. And God the Father left God the Son. And for three hours, Jesus hung between heaven and earth alone. Alone. And at the end of that time, The son said, the debt has been paid. It is finished. Jesus died. John 19.30. And John 19.40, Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. So what would Jesus say to you and me today? Jesus approached this week of Palm Sunday... Passion Week, knowing what his life was going to be filled with. Sixteen things happened in six days of major stress level. And Jesus' invitation to you and me found in Matthew chapter 11 is this. Come to me, all of you who are tired and weary and beaten down and find rest for your souls. Okay, Jesus, we're going to do that today. But Jesus, how did you deal with that week? How were you able to preach a sermon that says, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus, how were you to face betrayal and denial by your best friends? Jesus, how were you able to face humiliation and mockery and mutilation? How did you face all of that? I think we'll find the answer to what happened after the Lord's Supper. Jesus went to the garden. You see, it's not easy for us to take care of our souls. In fact, it's easy for us to forget about taking care of our souls. We'll spend a lot of money taking care of our bodies. We'll, uh, we'll get memberships at workout clubs. And we'll buy all kinds of workout equipment. And guys, I'm not scolding you for doing that. I've done the same thing. But we spend all kinds of money trying to get our body as healthy as it can be because we're going to think it's going to make us better and, and, and it will to a point. But I got news for you. Jack LaLanne died. <laughs> there was about a decade we didn't think he would, but he did. It eventually fell apart. What makes the difference most of all is the soul. So here's four simple keys to finding rest for your soul. i got to wrap it up. We see all four of these in the Garden of Gethsemane experience. Number one, we need some time of quietness. Our soul needs quiet. We need to draw apart to a peaceful, quiet setting. Pick a beach, a mountain, a creek, a park. Being in a quiet place allows peace to seep into our pores without any effort on our part. Quietness allows us to rest, to be free from the outside stimulus of noise, to be immune to the busyness of our lives. We need to find a quiet place to retreat. Jesus referred to it in one of his stories as go to your closet. 
put a quiet place. Number two, get into nature. Mankind was formed from the dust of the earth. God shaped us from the clay, from the ground of this earth. You and I are far more than dirt. We are far more than clay sculptures. God has adopted us. He's made his beloved sons and daughters. We are divinely imagined, divinely created, divinely formed and called. Nevertheless, to this day, there is something in us that needs the earth. We are bonded to this. From dust we came, and the Bible says, from dust we will return. I believe that nature is God's original book, his original declaration of himself to humanity. Before Adam ever had a book to read, he had creation to read. Romans 1.20 says, For From since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes have been clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Haven't you ever stood on a mountaintop and looked across there and said, Who but God could have done this? Haven't you ever looked at a river and said, wow, I, I stood at the Grand Canyon last summer and I said, and they think this is an accident? How? We need nature to find rest. Three, we need solitude. Too often we try to hurt our hearts behind busy schedules and lots of people. We either don't want to face God or we hurt so bad that we're afraid of his work in our hearts. Therefore, we hide the supposed need by serving, by caring, by doing for others. When we refuse to embrace solitude even occasionally, what we really are doing is we are running from God. And number four, we need some long soaking times. Not in a bathtub, but in the word of God and prayer. Isn't that what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane? He got to a quiet place. He got out into nature. He took three disciples with him and then he left them and he went on a little further by himself. And then he spent an evening, a long time, in hearing the voice of his Father and praying. Our souls consisting of our mind, our will, and our emotions are important. Our entire reality is determined by what we fill our souls with. If our soul is filled with worry and stress, anxiety, and fear, our lives will never be prosperous inside or out. However, if we teach our soul to find rest in God through nature, through quiet, through solitude, through word, we can experience the prosperity of our heart and external situations. So what do you need to do today to find rest for your soul? Why don't you learn from the example of Jesus in the most stress-filled week that anyone has ever faced? Get alone with God. And when you get this relationship right, then he will work through you to get these relationships right. And when this is right, and when this is right, this is really, really good. Let's pray. You respond as God has called your heart to respond today. Father, thank you for those kids this morning. Thank you for the sincerity of their faith, the simpleness of their worship, and the joy that they brought to us as we watched them. Father, thank you for a most valuable lesson that you have taught us in this most excruciating of days, Palm Sunday. Thank you that you have shown us that this world is cruel, just as it was to Jesus. Jesus himself said, that, hey, if they treat me this way, they're not going to treat you any better. But you told us you have overcome the world, and so we can have the peace that you bring in the midst of trouble. So, Lord, I hope that this morning... Enough of your word and truth has been revealed that there's a little stress decompression going on right now. I trust there are some who might even be coming to you and saying, Lord Jesus, I've never invited you to live in my life. I've handled life all of my own. At the beginning of this Easter week, I'm ready to stop being a hypocritical believer or fake believer in you. I'm ready to become a genuine 
son or daughter. I'm ready to invite you in my life and I promise I'll find times to be quiet. I'll find time to be alone with you. I'll find, I'll find time to immerse myself in your word and in conversation with you. Thank you, dear Jesus, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for the rest, peace, and joy that you bring. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go have a great day.